Hello and welcome to the Final Girls podcast where we explore the intersections of horror film and feminism. This is Anna Kofono, the Final Girls and your podcast host. For the next few months, we are tracing the lineage of female monsters in horror cinema and in each episode, I'm joined by a special guest to deep dive into a monster movie or two. We are fully into the horror films of the new millennium and today, well today we've got a jumbo sized episode for you. Usually our episodes are around 45 minutes, an hour long, but honestly there's not a single thing I could cut from the conversation with culture critic, podcaster and producer Jordan Cruciola, one of my favorite people from the internet, and in her own words, the world's foremost Jennifer's Body Scholar. Jordan joins me in today's episode to discuss in glorious depth two criminally underrated films from the cheerleader canon. First up, we cover Jennifer's Body, the 2019 horror film directed by Karen Kasama, written by Diablo Cody fresh off her Oscar win for Juno, and starring Megan Fox and Amanda Seyfried. In the film, the titular Jennifer turns into a succubus after she sacrifices Satan. And in the second part of our conversation, we'll be talking about the cheerleader witch zombie horror All Cheerleaders Die, directed by Lucky McKee and Chris Siverson where a rebel girl convinces the cheerleaders in her high school to take down the captain of the football team. Uh, that's until they face a supernatural hurdle. As a warning, as always, all our conversation will contain spoilers pretty much from the very beginning. And I truly, truly encourage you to seek out these films. They're both widely available and are excellent for a first watch and also are way deserving of a rewatch. So enjoy our conversation about Jennifer's body and all cheerleaders die. Jordan, I'm so pleased you agreed to come into this podcast to talk about these two murderous cheerleader movies with me. You're you're absolutely right. Somehow, wow, somehow till this very moment, I I had not put them both in the cheerleader canon and they absolutely are. Wow. Much, much disrespect to the devil's kettle devils on that one uh, for just <laughs> taking them out of the picture entirely. Uh, no, I'm thrilled. I am thrilled to be here. I, I am always happy to talk about Jennifer's body. And I am always happy that the idea of someone bringing But I'm a cheerleader, or not a But I'm a cheerleader, all cheerleaders die into the conversation <laughs> because it does not get enough love in horror circles or anywhere. But come on, we are the ones who should be talking about it. This is absolutely true. And I'm also only mildly um, scared or actually really excited to <laughs> be talking to the world's foremost Jennifer Jennifer's first body scholar. Yep, yep. That's so I'm fully self, expecting I, to get yeah, fooled. I, I, that is, that is self-styled and I stand with it <laughs> in, in, in strong conviction. So as, as, as I said to you before we started formally recording here, if anybody else would like to claim the title of world's foremost Jennifer's body scholar, Find me on Twitter. We should have a conversation because I think we've got a lot. We've got a lot of notes to share with each other. So let's bring our minds together. If you too think you are the foremost Jennifer's Body Scholar in the world. So let's kick off with Jennifer's Body first. You and me are going out tonight. Wear something cute, okay? You always do what Jennifer tells you to do. It's just that I like the same things that she likes. Hey, Jennifer. You look really pretty. Why don't you just come by my place? What was random? This isn't really your house, is it? We can play mommy and daddy. No way. <laughs> we always share your bed when we have slumber parties. Jennifer's evil. I know. No, I mean, she's actually evil. Not high school evil. Chip is looking really cute to me lately. 
How is he tasting these days? You are never a good friend. You could have anybody that you want. I chip. You're killing people. No, I'm killing boys. Are you scared? I you only murder boys. I go both ways. I will finish you if I have to. Okay. You can barely finish gym class. So what is your relationship with the film and with Karen Kusama's films in general? I am a um, big proponent of Karen Kusama, a uh, big fan. Uh, the funny thing about me and Jennifer's body is I was so excited to see it when it came out. I was fully hyped. Big Megan Fox fan. Loved Megan Fox in the Transformers movies. Uh, I absolutely understand the the correct critiques of the way she was handled at such a young age. Um as a, as a sex object in a, in a movie playing a teenager in which she was hardly, maybe not even done being a teenager herself uh, in Transformers. But honestly, actually, if you take the performance for on its face, Michaela Baines is an actually great action heroine. And Michaela Baines and Sam Witwicky together are actually one of my favorite screen couples ever. Shia Buff and Megan Fox had tremendous chemistry together. And she in her moxie, brought so much more to that character than was on the page. Um, She doesn't really actually get enough credit for bringing so much energy and so much life into Michaela as she did. Mm -hmm. Uh, It just sort of gets written off as like a trashy action role, but it's actually a pretty great action heroine role. And as such, I didn't have... Uh, there was no hang-up with me for Megan being the face Mm -hmm. of the film. I was very excited. I was like, oh my God. It's a horror movie and it's Megan Fox. I get to have both things at the same time. This sounds rad. And I liked, I I liked Juno very much. Um, but I was, I seemed, I felt like I was getting even more excited to see how Diablo Cody was going to bring her specific style Mm -hmm. to, to what was being, you know, teased poorly in the trailers for the movie at the time it was coming out in 2009. But I was very excited for the blend. Like I I was like, wow, these are, and I, Hey, Amanda Seyfried, like I'm a big love fan. I like her on that show. I would like to see her big doll eyes put in this role and see what she can do opposite Megan. So I was super jazzed, went and saw it, loved it. Uh, the, the the kiss had no idea that was coming, knocked me out of my chair, uh, went and saw it multiple times in theaters, had no idea. I didn't have a lot of friends at the time who really liked horror movies um, so the fact that nobody else around me wanted to see it was like, yeah, I get it. Like, I don't have many friends who I would go see a vampire movie with anyway, like a succubus movie with. So the fact that like people around me weren't clamoring to see it, it was like, yeah, I get that this is more my thing. I didn't understand people didn't like this movie genuinely till like five years ago. I didn't wow. understand. Like, I, I, you know, I even I didn't give a shit about like box office or anything like mm-hmm. that. And I wasn't like looking up Rotten Tomato scores. Like, I was doing culture journalism, but I was at Wired and it was sort of very much more adjacent to like the core of entertainment mm-hmm. industry journalism that I would move more toward at Vulture in New York Magazine. So I was just kind of like, I was only sort of reporting on stuff from like an interest in fan point of view as opposed to like an industry beat reporter perspective. When people, when I started seeing like the, you know, film Twitter, uh, I I know so many wonderful writers from there now and so many delightful people, but as an entity, it's horrible. And when I started seeing the like film Twitter mindset happening around Jennifer's body, the like the but the the but actually it's it's bad before it's sort Mm -hmm. of reclamation started. I was like, wait, wait, anybody, anybody out there thinks Jennifer's body is not a great movie? No idea. Mm. Fully no idea. So then I was. I, would, I had long been outraged as a Fox fan at her mistreatment in the media for ages, like forever angry about that. So then I, I had a new anger that was about defending Jennifer's body that I didn't know I needed to do, an action I didn't know I needed to do on top of my longstanding, like in defense of Megan Fox mindset. So mm. I only came late to the fact that this movie needed to be reappraised. But then once it did, I was like, well, I guess I've got to throw myself all into this because it's extremely important. This is extremely important, this movie to me and to genre cinema. And okay, hell yeah. And then once a couple years later, once the sort of reclamation Mm -hmm. started, which 
anybody is free to correct me of sort of when this formally started cropping up, but I sort of hang the online grassroots um, reclamation of the movie on that Mary Sue piece. Um, I forget who the writer mm-hmm. was, but I believe the title of it was. So when are we going to apologize to Megan Fox? That that to me was the first thing that started, and and then there were ver- there were variations on that article that started coming out, and then there were the feature pieces that started coming out, like Lewis Peitzman's great feature at BuzzFeed where he spoke mm-hmm. to Karin and Diablo about it, and and then it started getting more of a formalized movement. So that happened, I think, around like twenty. I think that was twenty seventeen. I think Lewis's piece came out in twenty. 18 and then 2019 was the 10th anniversary of it so which mm-hmm. by then by the time the anniversary came around the the conversation seemed to have shifted very distinctly to instead of being hey guys Megan like Jennifer's body is actually good to hey guys it's time to celebrate that really good movie Jennifer's body like it, it felt like there was a tone of the defensiveness in the tone of defending it mm-hmm. the defensiveness in the tone of protecting it had changed to a celebratory tone because it, it kind of seems like we won. Like it seems like it seems like the mm-hmm. the Jennifer's body protectors won. Like we won. So it's an interesting point to before we go into the actual movie itself, the text itself, mm-hmm. it's interesting to understand the context of it, to why it even needed reclaiming. And I find it fascinating that you kind of discover it sort of mm-hmm. after the fact, after you'd already fallen in love with the film. But why do you think it was um, so reviled or reviled is a strong word, but there was a really distinctive antagonism towards it from the very, very start at the time of release. Oh, yeah. And why do you think it was and kind of what about it kind of made it so divisive around the time where it was actually formally out in 2009? It's it's we were just so on the we were so on the precipice of so many aspects of it working and of so many of being able to get so many aspects of it that I think we were we were getting attuned enough to the conversations that would be fundamental to Jennifer's body to where Mm -hmm. they were still agitating people like they were close enough to the discourse to where they weren't like what what's what's feminism what's what's gay people what's queerness those things weren't so outside our perspective that they were like an unknown evil they were close enough, though, to where they were experiencing almost like this pre-lash in the discourse before they were actually going to become, I think, fully fledged part of the ways that we break down and talk about pop culture generally in ways that are widely now widely accepted. But it was like mm-hmm. this sort of last, it was like that last gasp of an era, not of like, we made it, we solved misogyny. No, we have not. But mm-hmm. we are at a point now where calling out misogyny is a routine part of examining art. Whereas at that time, it was sort of the the dying days of the of media culture where you couldn't, where that wasn't de rigueur, where it wasn't allowed, where it was unheard of, and where m- magazine like magazine feature piece after feature piece was being you know profile after profile was being written about actresses where they were like framed by their male writers to sound like first dates and they were negging and they were sexist and they were objectifying so often and. Like, I, th- I think I saw somebody on Twitter post once last year, like every woman with a every woman who had a profile written about her between like 2000 and 2010 deserves an apology. Mm-hmm. And then someone responded and was like, or every woman of all time. And but there was this like particular <laughs> form of celebrity access journalism that happened around that mm-hmm. time when blogs were popping up like per- Perez Hilton and like the superficial mm-hmm. where we had more access to celebrities entirely on our own terms because social media hadn't come around yet. And so there was this vying Mm -hmm. for attention and there was this star making machine that demanded imaging and persona building in a way that almost seemed to reflect like this, the, the, the prefab band days of like the monkeys back in the 19, Mm. like sixties and seventies, like the, like the Jacksons and the monkeys and these sort of family units where we created a show around them and a whole a whole product packet, like a whole packaging ecosystem around them. And it felt like we were doing a lot of that in the late 90s and 2000s, again, around like boy bands and pop stars, Britney Spears and the Backstreet Boys. So there was this commodification of the starlet that felt like it was dredging up this old bad thing we had done in like the mid-century. And it was vicious because it was the internet too. And that was making everything more competitive. It was meaning there was more space to be taken up which means there were more covers and websites for people to be on. And instead of like moderating access, it seemed like the goal of publicity was to put your star, your product into as many things as possible. 
And with Megan, the branding that that she very much was aware of at the time was the sex bomb image, was was the, you know, the girl on the cover of GQ being photographed by Terry Richardson in a bikini and like with a sucker in her mouth. And Megan was very much aware that what appealed to people about her, particularly men, was this pinup image, was this wild bisexual image, was the like basically the Mrs. You know, Mrs. Steal Your Man, maybe Mrs. Steal Your Girl after her like, you know, comments about like making it sound like she, you know, would like to engage in a relationship with Olivia Wilde and, and that were that were much mm-hmm. ballyhooed at the time. There was so much of an idea around her that it became a sort of inescapable trap and and she knew that too you read any profile substantial profile of fox from the time she was very much i think that the the title of the new york times profile that came out about her in 2008 or 9 was like the like the making and unmaking of megan fox and it was a full Mm. meta examination of megan's role in creating her image and knowing that it was effective while also carrying with it the burdens of backlash that she was entirely keyed into. But she was, regardless of her self-awareness, spoken about as a bimbo. She was Mm -hmm. taken down for her role in these thin, fluffy Transformers films. She was reduced to uh, a sex object. Um, And it didn't matter what she said. It it didn't matter her intellectual role in her own life and her self-awareness. People decided these things about Megan Fox, and it was a time, too, that we could objectify comfortably and we wouldn't self-exam... We wouldn't We wouldn't scrutinize that at all. And it was also a time where I feel like when women were extremely complicit in that problem, but just, I just don't like her face. There was a lot of condemnation of mm. like, you know, er, like early Taylor Swift was like, that. I mean, she just annoys me, you know? I just don't like her face. And that could be like a valid criticism for women being bitchy about other women. And mm. in that, like, I don't know, competitive or consumptive or, you know, covetous way that things get sort of mixed up with sort of female-female relationships. But, and then there was, you know... Diablo Cody, again, I've said this over and over again. I I cannot hmm. c- cite where this quote came from. I do not remember where it came from, but I swear to God it's real. There is a quote where Diablo Cody, Cody talks about she had won her Oscar for Juno, and she knew she had yes. the most capital in Hollywood that she was ever going to have. And she had this dream project she wanted to make, and it was Jennifer's body. And she knew Mm -hmm. it was going to take all that capital from the Oscar to get what she knew she had her carte blanche after that. So she was like, fine, I'm going to finally make that. I'm going to make this movie because now's the like probably one time I'm going to get to do it. And then she effectively Mm -hmm. ended up spending all that cultural capital on that one movie. And you have uh, Karin Kusama, who has gone from, you know, girl fight you know, breaking out at Sundance with like Michelle Rodriguez to getting that tap to make a studio film in Eon Flux. So she had like in the eyes of the studio system sort of leveled up in that way where they could hand her blockbuster. She had earned her place. And so coming off of Flux, you know, a big Charlize Theron movie, she got attached to this at Fox Atomic. And so you had these three women and Fox was definitely, or Kusama was definitely a more low key figure at the time than than Cody and Fox Mm -hmm. were. But the alchemy of all three of them coming together, and it's kind of crazy how it worked. The marketing was horrible. The way the studio tried to get this movie out was so wrong-headed and so misguided and, and betrayed the spirit of the movie. And yet, they were basically left alone to make the movie they wanted to make. Like when you hear mm-hmm. Karin and Diablo talk about making this movie, there were tri- there were trials. But it, it seems to start to get most heated when the packaging and presentation of the movie was what became mm-hmm. a com- what, was what became an issue. It wasn't like they had a ton of interfering studio notes. They didn't have a producer there staring over their shoulder trying to get them to change the movie. They didn't end up with some Frankenstein product that wasn't what they intended. They made the movie they meant to make, which is kind of incredible. The studio, Fox at the time, Fox Atomic, just had no goddamn idea how to put it out there correctly because they didn't ex- they didn't understand the actual target audience to be valid to be a valid audience they didn't understand young women to be a valuable commodity as far as like people with dollars to spend they just went straight for that teen boy audience that they thought would follow megan from the transformers movies and especially it's it's interesting you pointed out it's um at the precipice of teen girls and especially well women in general Mm -hmm. being validated as a valid genre audience as well because this is this is entirely a both a Karen Kasama film a Diablo Cody film and a Megan Fox film it's wild but they seem to have only latched on to the superficial Megan Fox aspect it's like yes but the audience for this film is not necessarily the Transformers audience Mm -hmm. or the audience that you marketed Transformers to so it needs a different packaging and language which is you know notoriously what the this film was failed at mm-hmm. and obviously it's not the responsibility of the filmmakers but of the 
the marketing departments and the studios, but the marketing departments live blissfully in the shadows and are never blamed as much as the stars or the filmmakers are for any film quote unquote flopping well yeah and 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 and, and Karen has been very on the record <clears throat> multiple mm. times at this point saying that uh like there was a, a a young man in a test screening of of Jennifer's body who had but one note on the card the feedback card that he handed over uh at the end of his time in there and it was needs more boobs and <clears throat> that was who the studio was listening to so yep. the first trail, the first marketing materials that came out took Amanda Seyfried completely out of the the visuals, uh, elided entirely over the fact that the best friendship at the core of this movie was its central love story, and mm-hmm. made it look like you were going to see Megan Fox taking off her clothes, and it was utterly unrepresentative of the tone, the themes, the mm-hmm. the facts of the story itself, and completely betrayed why uh, Megan agreed to do this movie in the first place, why Diablo wanted Megan specifically to be in this movie, and mm-hmm. surely why Karin signed on to direct this kind of story at this time. Like, they just, they, they couldn't have fucked it up worse. And, and I think even, there's a, there's a vulture, old Vulture link of Adam Brody even talking about how the studios couldn't have done a worse job, only could have, could have only almost done such a bad job of getting the movie out if they had intentionally been trying to screw it over. Like, even he acknowledged, I think, on the movie's press tour, like, I don't know how they could have screwed that up so bad on accident. Like, was some, like, who made who angry? Like, cause that was completely <laughs> terrible. So let's get into the movie itself, cause it's gonna be a much more joyous part of our conversation. So let's talk about Jennifer, and she's inextricably linked with. Megan. Mm-hmm. So what do you think of Jennifer as the lead character monster of the film, but also of Megan's portrayal of her and all the metatextual layers attached to her playing Jennifer? When you can bring in when when it when it is there's the, the great stars aligning circumstance of being able to bring in the narrative of the star themselves into their role. And if you're able to if you're able to fluidly in integrate the star and the character in a way that provides added value to the story. It's such a wonderful gift to be able to see that every so often in, in film or television. Um, Allison Williams in both Get Out and then subsequently in The Perfection, Blake Lively in A Simple Favor. The impact of those characters and the, <clears throat> the way that you buy into the twists about them is amplified so much more because you bring in your baggage about what you know about those actresses. And it makes the reveals and it makes, it makes the reveals even crazier and even more surprising. And it makes the fun of their characters even more delightful because you are unpacking your own biases as you go. And you're like, well, that was a fun time. Like you're almost glad you came in with your assumptions so you could be kind of kicked Mm -hmm. in the teeth and told you were wrong. And you're like, I'm so pleased to have been made a fool of by thinking I knew where this was going. And with um, Megan Fox in this role, Diablo knew she she could read she knew how the press treated her and she saw how the press Hmm. treated Megan and she knew that for what she was trying to say with this movie um the sacrifice that Jennifer Check would be in this to the the idea that that she would be sacrificed for in this world was very much embodied by Megan in Hollywood and Megan too saw this role and felt like wow I am feeling really abused and dragged around and Mm -hmm. I'm feeling exploited. And I think that like from what she said and when I was able to interview her at a a 10th anniversary screening was it it kind of like, Mm -hmm. this isn't her direct quote, but to me it sort of in my mind boils down to like this movie was kind of like her primal scream opportunity to Mm -hmm. exercise the way she had felt taken advantage of and screwed over in Hollywood and make a movie that directly commented on those circumstances, but in the context of a high school And because the politics of how we sexualize and mistreat women certainly have a very vibrant and thriving Petri dish that begins in like college, um, high school and middle school when when women start young women, you know, when girls, not young women, when girls start going through puberty and are treated as young women before they hit the threshold of 18 because we become Mm -hmm. commodities as soon as we start having boobs. And so to have... Megan in this role where she you I got I got to see concentrated that thing that I did love so much about the Michaela Baines part which was the clear Mm -hmm. spirit and ferocity of Megan 
but embodied through just what happens to be one of my favorite screen archetypes, which is the like queen bitch teen girl in a high school movie. Like that just like that's not going to be ev- one of everybody's favorite things, but it's for a lot of people and certainly me, one of my favorite things. And it's so immediately the fact that it opens with that quote from Amanda's from a needy Amanda's character needy les nikki mm-hmm. needy les uh talking about like her lifelong friendship with Jennifer and sandbox love never dies and they're the immediate interdependent at least semi-emotionally abusive dynamic that they have between Mm -hmm. the two of them I think really immediately for the people who for the for the women especially women and girls who caught on to this movie when it when they first saw it it so immediately rang bells from imbalanced and vital relationships that we had had in our own young lives in a way that was appropriately vicious and appropriately Mm tongue-in-cheek and appropriately obsessive, but also surprisingly respectful and surprisingly tender Mm -hmm. and surprisingly empathetic about the wonderfully rich reality of those dynamics that are so easy to parody and make look like Mm -hmm. purely sort of salacious or dysfunctional fun from the outside, but that are actually fundamental to the to the emotional lives of the people in them and they are the, they are the center of our worlds they are they are the you know they are the, the when you when you're in one of those dynamics that other person is your son that you turn around and this jo- this movie did such a good job of honoring that dynamic that it provides the foundation for all of the sen- sensational things that come afterwards because you have that heart so clear that beating heart so clearly established at the very beginning with um Needy and Jennifer and Amanda Seyfried's big wide-eyed compliment to like the brunette, you know, vixen of Devil's Kettle uh, is such a perfect contrast for us to sort of attach onto. And what do you think setting Jennifer's body within the horror genre brings to exploring this extremely recognizable but also extremely toxic central friendship? In, at the heart of the story. Well, and, and, and the, the, gifts, the gift that horror gives us is so well embodied in, in both uh, All Cheerleaders Die and Jennifer's Body, which is where teen movies are wonderful. I love a teen movie. I love a high school coming of age movie. Um, they, they are, when you can make those a horror movie, that's just the absolute best because you're taking these, I mean, that's why something like Booksmart is really fun because it's taking the one crazy night movie and putting it into the context of a couple of outcast high schoolers and you put them in the biggest, craziest scenarios they could be in because that's the fun of it is seeing like young people do crazy things that's why the movie like good boys was it good boys or bad boys the one like was so you know successful when it came out a couple years ago we like seeing little boys swear we like seeing like we like seeing you know young girls ripping up through the town on a crazy night because like at the end of the day they're only 16 and this is wild and they're they're behaving badly well you just take the most hyperbolic kind of movie we have, which is horror, that lets you do everything bigger and louder and more on the nose. You you get to take out all subtlety and then you get to put in the metaphor of like body transformation and maybe like monsters, maybe a succubus, maybe a vampire mm-hmm. and all the violence and and salaciousness that goes with that. And then you put that in like one of the most fun and bouncing and sort of like playing on your heartstrings and your nostalgia genres possible like the high school friendship film you get you you get the best of sort of like the emotional bomb that cinema can be because it gets to make everything bigger and louder and you get to have like to me because I like this kind of stuff it just makes everything that I like about like the teens the teen genre even more fun because Mm -hmm. it gets to be brighter and it gets to be louder and it gets to be crazier and it's not like a oh we kind of lost the narrative thread we we sort of got off track here it's like no it's supposed to be this is a horror mm-hmm. movie like t- keep turning that volume up that's what we want and if there's anything where the blood if there's anything where the where the emotion and the viscera and the pure emotional relentlessness is turned up it is friendships between teenage girls so oh, God. if there yes. if there is if there is a genre that is most indicative of the unruliness of the physical and emotional time in one's life that is being a teenage girl, the only appropriate analog for that can either be completely absurdist comedy or completely unhinged horror. (laughs) 
And that brings me neatly on to my next question is, so in this series, uh, I'm focusing a lot kind of on the female monsters on screen. But Jennifer's body is fascinating for many reasons, but it's probably one of the, probably the best, but it's also a rare type of monster to bring into a very familiar setting and a very familiar genre that has its own expectations. So it's both a high school movie with its own set of tropes and expectations from audiences. And it's both a horror monstery movie that has that comes with its own set of expectations and ingrained audiences. But then it brings in the succubus, which is not really a familiar monster no. in either one of those genres. Really, it's no. not the one, you know, we've got vampires, we've got zombies, mm-hmm. we've got witches, we've got multiple versions, and some of them are much more coded feminine or much more associated with um with femininity or with women on screen than they are than others are. But succubus, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. what do you think kind of about <clears throat> um what do you think about the choice of monster for Jennifer's body? I it's kind of ideal. Um, it, it's, it's actually quite perfect because um, I, I'm pulling up a little definition in front of me so I can just read. It, it's just Wikipedia. This is not a primary source, but for just like a sort of offhand, let's put some terms to it. Like it's a succubus is a demon or supernatural entity in folklore in female form that appears in dreams to seduce men, usually through sexual activity. And that's Lolita. That's That's mm-hmm. what Lolita is. It's... There is so much accountability shifted onto girls, not young women. Sometimes young women, yes, but in the case of, you know, reality and this movie, girls, a kid, a teenager, um, to be accountable for the desirousness of men and the people around them. It is um, their responsibility to not tempt. It is their responsibility to cover their bodies lest they provoke it is their responsibility to make up for the boys will be boys ethos that lets the 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 boy the the, the kids around them the the male kids around them um, get away with preying upon uh, girls their their girls in their peer group because <clears throat> well what were we wearing did we have it coming were you asking for it and so that is epitomized by the snapshot of Jennifer and we get this brunette dangerous looking. A uh, teenage girl who, as uh, as her friend, best friend tells at the start at the the start of the movie, uh, tits are Jennifer's thing. Like Needy has to dress in certain ways to accentuate certain ways about her body because tits then cleavage that's that's Jennifer's thing. And she's like flirting with a adult man in a bar in Devil's Kettle the night of the Low Shoulder show, and she talks about like having sex with one of the cadets on the police force who is most certainly not in high school himself. And she's given that agency and given that self-determination, but she is also <clears throat> made to answer for that crime in a sort of backwards way that we never really see in a movie where the, the band Low Shoulder, who wants to be big famous pop stars, they sacrifice her because they assume her, all of her, her bad girl swagger and posturing actually means... Well, she, actually, she isn't the thing that she honestly presents herself as we're going to make the assumption about her because we know better that she's actually got to be a virgin because no girl's selling it this hard that she is like so sexually adventurous and experienced is, is actually for real. So it turns on its head the idea of, well, no actually means yes. Well, low shoulder decides that because what they need from her is to be a virgin for a sacrifice that that yes, like that her saying yes to sex in her life. Well, no, that actually that actually means no, because right now that's what we need it to mean. and That's what we want it to mean. So regardless of, you know, one of the great things about this movie is that both Jennifer and Needy have active sex lives and Mm -hmm. they're not needy is preserved despite having a sexual relationship with her boyfriend chip and so therefore as like the final you know the final girl as the horror heroine she lives in the end despite being you know sullied by not being a virgin anymore well it's jennifer's unapologetic departure from her virginity that is actually Mm -hmm. what damns her in the eyes of these men who need her to serve a different purpose but because she looks the way she does surely and because she has the reputation that she does there can be a sort of societal excusing away of what would have happened to jennifer because you can imagine the scenario in which there's a if there's a scene in this movie where she goes to the authorities and she's like well low shoulder did this to me and they're like well jennifer we have heard things about you well jennifer 
we we do, you know, it's a small town and like word gets around. And if you don't want people to think that you're that kind of girl, then you should probably make different choices. And that can be sort of considered a, like a, 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 re- a revisionist um, sort of extension of the narrative that's obviously not canonical, but it's played out too mm. many times for us to say that that's not exactly what we know would happen in real life. So the the deftness of this movie to take those to take those high school tropes, those constructs, like you know the virginal girl, the you know the nice girl, then the the mean girl, the one who's having sex, and put them in such p- perfectly ph- physically embodied forms as Amanda Seyfried and, and Megan Fox, and then to subvert those things entirely and do it joyfully and do it darkly mm. and viciously while also making you laugh like this movie is funny as hell and it still is yes. it's somehow like it's almost like Diablo Cody's way of writing dialogue is so specific to her that it's almost not it's almost it's not of its time it is of it is only of Diablo Cody you don't watch this and think like oh this sounds like 2009 Diablo Cody never sounded yes. like 2009 she made certain parts of 2009 sound like her but she exists in a snow globe of her own so you watch it now and it's just like oh I don't actually feel yes. rooted in a time and place here except for those low-rise jeans I feel actually just like the- rooted in the brain of Diablo Cody I wanted to ask you about Jennifer Speak actually in this because <laughs> I think one Speak. of the one of the one of the two only things that dated this movie when I rewatched it for the purposes of this conversation mm-hmm. was a reference to Maroon Five as something that was cool. right, right, and <laughs> and um, I have a I have a notorious hatred for Adam Levine, but I'm not going to get into that. It would derail this whole thing, but. <laughs> And also a reference to MySpace from Low Shoulder. Right, right, but right. other than that, it has this Heather-esque kind of bubble of um, of timelessness where the teenagers speak like teenagers in a language that doesn't belong to anyone except that particular high school in that particular yes. small town. And it could be any small town that, or any big town that, or any yes. high school or any even subgroup of teenagers that all have their own particular way of speaking. And Jennifer is fascinating yep. because she almost has a dialogue, much like Heather's, much like the Heather's yep. in the film, have a dialogue that they almost create as a form of dominating the conversation. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. So I wonder kind of what you think about her way of speaking, especially to Needy and interestingly also <laughs> to Chip, who I loved her yeah. antagonistic borderline jealous relationship to her best friend's boyfriend no it it is i it is jennifer it, it's jennifer speak it, it's not it is not of the aughts it just happened to mm. have been created in the aughts and it, it is a hyperbolic version i think of the way that like the the sort of clueless california girl vernacular was very like a pop culture focused way of talking that Mm. proliferated is like oh this is how young people talk when it's like well no it's also like the idea of the valley girl accent is like nobody in that movie was from the valley and if they were it was very much made fun of like this is a beverly hills girl this is a bel-air girl (laughs) and so it it took something and it like it it was like a take on it was a hyperbolic take on like how youth people talk that like you said just Mm. actually makes ends up being when when you look at it in 2020 it's like the town of devil's kettle was just really isolated and somehow these kids just develop their own local vernacular and way of talking and and that is when you have just somebody who is very charismatic and who is sort of central to how you move through the world people take the cues from those people and absorb that it, it's like i think they do that too and never been kissed like there's the the popular mm. kids like say like oh you know rufus is the word spread it like wildfire and then they they've decided that rufus is the word for cool and so throughout the movie more and more people start adopting the word rufus who are from the lower social the lower social parts of the spectrum because rufus has been deemed cool by the cool kids and megan is Megan is Megan is Jennifer Check. She's like the head of the cheerleading team. She was like, what is it like the snowflake queen? You know, oh, that was, you know, two years ago before your eating disorder, as Needy points out to us. Like, so it's very believable that there could be this microcosm in this high school where people talk like that kind of because this girl talks like that. And it matriculates out to enough key people to where they perpetuate that style of speaking that it kind of. It's a great representation of Diablo Cody and her just like sheer wittiness, and I do love it so. But it is also, if you read into it further in that layer, t- 
totally believable that one person could potentially form their own little vernacular for the way that like maybe that Mm. four years of Devil's Kettle High School or like the two or three years around her, that's how they talk. Because that's kind of just how slang and and local vocabulary takes hold. She was an influence, really on the scale of Devil's Kettle, uh, Jennifer was an influencer. (laughs) Yeah, she was an influencer of the MySpace era, which (laughs) was probably the the innocent, the true innocent times of social media. yeah. For, yeah, for those of those who live through it, <laughs> you know, the hardest choice you had to make was who were your top eight friends. That's it. But a, a, a toxic system, Tox, to <laughs> online online social toxicity begins. Oh uh, yeah, it was uh, yeah, good times. Oh yeah, um, <laughs> better times yeah! at least. Simpler, at the very least, simpler. <laughs> There's a couple of things that I want to touch on, but one of the interesting things I'm going to bring it back into genre Mm -hmm, is mm -hmm. the way that Jennifer's monstrosity manifests and her transformation um, begins fairly early on in the film. I almost surprised myself whenever I watched it that it it comes in really, really quickly and it's extremely graphic and extremely violent from the very, very beginning and also very supernatural. There is no finding out what she is. She is just a fully fledged succubus. Yeah. So... I wonder what your thoughts are kind of on the way that her monstrosity is filmed, the way that her body becomes Mm -hmm. um, demonic Mm -hmm. or, you know, possessed. There's many ways you can refer to it and none of them I feel are entirely accurate Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. because it just sits in its own in its own canon of its own creation. You know, it, it has to be touched on, of course, I think that the the way in which the, the transformation is instigated when she's taken into the woods and she's put on the stump by low shoulder and the way that they mm-hmm. the way that they sing and the way that they mock mm. her and the way that they laugh. Um, and, you know, the, the gag of like they have to print off the directions from the Internet for how to do the ritual. Like that's how bumbling and stupid they are. And like the Internet is becoming a more ubiquitous part of our lives. And we all carry our map quest dire- directions around us to get places. The, the mockery and abuse of her emotionally and her pain and her humanity when she's on that stump as they're about to kill her. They don't think she's coming back. They, she's not supposed to rise again. They, mm. They're killing a person. And they are, they're going to leave her, this teen girl's body for dead in the woods and they're going to go on to be big, rich, and famous. Um, which is something that the rich and famous are allowed to do is to leave the bodies in the wake behind them um, in the entertainment industry that acutely takes the form of, of leaving women and, women and girls discarded behind them. And Mm -hmm. Megan has spoken about how intense, and and as has Karin, about how intense that day was on set to get through filming the abuse. It was freezing cold. It was, you know, nighttime in in Canada. And she's laying there having to scream for her life as she's being made fun of. And she's having these adult men laugh at her, as as they're supposed to in, in accordance with the script. But it was a very cathartic experience it, you know, in, in good and bad ways that she felt like it was analogous mm-hmm. to how she was sort of ripped apart through the studio system and, and by the media uh, at that time in her career, which to have that all come pouring out on a set in a way that you're being encouraged to go through that and come out the other side and not be like going through it and having like the director or or a producer be like, hey, what's wrong? What, what's going on? Are you OK? But to have someone like Karin there uh, understanding to to have that be the reason that you were put in that part you mm. she wasn't meant to experience that catharsis and hide why and internalize it and internalize it or, or process it silently she was meant to put herself personally in that experience and live her her grief and her rage and her sadness and her fear through it so it was like oh no I'm I'm allowed to to take to put the pain forward right now I'm allowed to to put the darkness you know behind this very burnished pop image and have that be the fuel that gets me through this and I'm I'm supposed to acknowledge why and mm. with something like what I really like a thing I really like about this movie is that a thing we do I think uh, it's done well often but I think a thing we tend to do too much in American movies ex- is explain things and I like an explanation. I like to be clear on things, but I, I think there's a, a need mm. to grapple with the supernatural or the strange or the unexpected in a way that creates a lot of dead narrative time. Like, you know, you watch you watch movies like the you watch movies like Ringu in in J- Japan, and there's a sort of a me- closer level of buy-in to the supernatural permeation of our natural world, mm-hmm. where there isn't as much need to explain that there has been a violation between the boundaries 
of of the material and the immaterial and now those worlds are blending and bad things are happening there's sort of like oh wait you awakened the curse we're fucked how could you have awakened the curse this is bad like now we're gonna have to deal with the after effects of that whereas in so many american movies there's so much time dedicated to the gaslighting you didn't see that that's not real what are you talking about there's got to be an explanation for this there's this sort of like inherent disbelieving and a sort of Mm-hmm. For as fundamentalist as this country is religious, there's it, it, religiously there is a, a a wallop of sort of like spirituality and reckoning reckoning with death in everyday life. That's something that we very much keep separate in in American life, life from death, and it's a very scary thing. And so this movie doesn't spend a lot of time explaining to you what Jennifer is. You kind of just have to come to it on your own. And maybe if you want to do some additional research, you can do that. Needy does her research and, and we learn from her, you know, in the movie. But with Jennifer, there isn't this reckoning that she has to come to with her new identity. She just is it. And it's kind of like, all right, mm-hmm. there's a sort of su- there's this sort of subtextual. All right. You thought I was the monster before. I'll just be the monster now. Like you, you thought I was just this sort of ravenous teen girl, you know, wrecking my way through the world. Guess what? Now I drink boys blood to sustain myself like I am that man-eating little girl. I am that Lolita that will cannibalize you mm. and seduce you away from your self-determination that you feared. And I'm not going to like fret about it. I'm going to stand in front of my mirror and I'm going to feel myself and I'm going to sort of experiment with the limits of my power by setting my own tongue on fire and see what happens. And I'm going to look, I'm going to be talking to my best friend on the phone and be, she's going to be telling you about like bodies still burning at the, at the bar that, you know, is now ash on the ground. And I'm going to say, I am a god. Like, there is a very rapid leaning into her power that is very true Mm -hmm. to Jennifer Check. Like, Jennifer wouldn't have a crisis of confidence about this. She wouldn't have a crisis of conscience about this. She would be like, all right, like, my hair's getting stringy, my complexion's getting shitty, so I need to go out there and hit up my Sephora, which is drinking out of Kyle Gallner's body in an abandoned house, and so I'm going (laughs) to do what I need to do. And I love the rapidity with which she just goes into her new phase. It's great. We don't waste time. And it's exactly what Jennifer would do. And Megan's Megan's proficiency with ballsiness and brazenness and and screen comedy is it allows Mm. her to really thrive in that character without having to get muddled down in like the transition aspects of it. The change happens and she is now living the life of, of the 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 thing that she is post change, mm. which is not too far divorced from the thing that men make women into when women are not agreeable and do not do what they say. I could listen to you talk about Jennifer's body for oh. hours, but to start wrapping up and moving <laughs> into our next yes. film, I wanted one of the things that I feel gets forgotten, or maybe not now, as we've you know, as the reclamation of Jennifer's body is kind of almost complete yeah, yeah. you know when we finally get a blu-ray release with a decent cover that will, i think will be the yes. final version of the, the reclamation will be finalized yes. but one of the things i think kind of gets forgotten very often from the narrative around jennifer's body is that it is a queer horror oh film. yes or at least that is you know my understanding absolutely of it. so what do you think of this of needy and Jennifer's relationship as being a love story mm-hmm. and not just a friendship? The, the the queer horror aspect of this movie is so rewarding because it is both um, obviously textual in the way that they, you know, we see them kissing each other and we understand clearly in that moment, if we may have assumed before, that there is an additional element of this friendship where it is defined at least in part by like probably throughout their years together, like as Jennifer says, like, but we always share Mm -hmm. your bed when we have sleepovers. This is an element of their friendship. Like sometimes it gets Mm -hmm. handsy. Sometimes it gets physically involved. But at the same time, what we see so often, and I love, I love psychosexual terrorizing female friendship movies. Those are some of my, that's, that's possible. That is absolutely one of my favorite categories of film. I love, um, heavenly creature or was it beautiful creatures or heavenly creatures heavenly creatures heavenly creatures single white female yeah love heavenly creatures love single white female love um you know a fan of persona which is more muted but there's still like a usurpation of 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 absolutely of self by these two like sort of mirror imaged women big fan of that whole canon truly i i love those kinds of movies what we don't get to see 
hardly ever, slightly more now, but still hardly ever, Mm. is the queering of intimate relationships between women that can exist between a romantic relationship, a friend relationship, a sexual relationship, and a totally, like, platonic relationship. There, There is indeed gray areas within all of those sectors that are out sort of the bounds of what heteronormativity uh, tells us that that just that makes them that that can puts them in their compartments from one another like i for example am a panromantic gray asexual person that is how i identify i didn't have that language until i was like in i was 28 years old but like once i Mm -hmm. like had the words and it was explained to me which is like capable of being attracted to any old person um the pan and then the asexual obviously giving you the like not having sex, but the gray in my case with a caveat to where like that's negotiable. Like I am to this point in my life have not had sex with a person, but it is not it is something that I know is not necessarily a, a hard stop for me forever. Like to me, it's mm-hmm. something that like my sexuality feels a bit like a moving target. And I think there will be a process of evolution where along the lines like those circumstances might change or or a person might change my personal circumstances. Um Whereas, like, an aromantic person, that's, you know, sort of colloquially defined as, like, my orientation is no. Like, no, no mm. touching, no kissing, none, no physical stuff. Yes. Whereas for me, I'm, I'm a very physical person. I'm a very affectionate individual. And as, a, as an ace person, the loves of my life are my friendships. That is mm. the, that is the, that is, that is the peak of intimacy for me. And, and, but for being sexually involved with people... I will give myself over as much to an intimate connection emotionally as another person is willing to meet me in that regard. And what that contrib- what that incorporates to with Jennifer's body is that we see in this movie the central friendship between Jennifer and Needy is the central love story without taking away mm-hmm. from the genuine connection between Needy and Chip. What we so often see in the mm-hmm. psychosexual like female terror movies is that it is them against the world is that these relationships must exist at the cost of all other relationships, is that these two people are a microcosm where they don't know where one ends and the other begins, and the pressure of that and the consumptive power of it drives them to be murderous and insane. And that stuff is super fun to watch, and I love it, and it's erotic sometimes, and it can be really hot and fun. But that's not quite, hopefully, real life for people. Whereas I can have these friendships in my life that are not paramount to romantic relationships, but tantamount. They exist in equal importance, Mm. which is something that society tells us is not real. Because there's that phrase, we're just friends. As though friendship cannot exist at an emotionally significant tier to the romantic love in one's life. Well, what we see in this movie is, is Jennifer and Needy being interdependent on one another and having this actual, like, tell it pathic bond with one another where they can like needy mm-hmm. can feel where jennifer is and what she's doing but that doesn't mean she loves chip less there is not less room in her life for chip i mean you have to divide one's time and of course people get jealous of one another that's just relationships but it doesn't come at the cost of her love for chip she is just as devoted to him mm-hmm. as she is a jennifer but they occupy separate parts mm-hmm. of her life so they don't have to be in competition with one another they can coexist and the fact that this movie recognizes that it doesn't have to be a war between these women and the world for them to be as close to each other as they feel compelled to be, while also allowing for them to have other meaningful relationships in their life, is so much more indicative of how the real world balance actually is when you're juggling the different types of relationships, you know, in your in your sphere. And also, it is so much more respectful of the meaning and depth and connection of these these friendships in our lives. And, and you know, speaking in the context of women, the, the necessity mm-hmm. of female connectivity between one another in a world that is so hostile to us, to have those partnerships and companionships and, and, and group dynamics where we can intimately bond with one another in a way that reinforces each of us and protects each of us and strengthens each of us and allows for us to be vulnerable in the face of so many things that want to hurt us. This is vital. And 
So I get my best friendship movie where like I get the great toxic female friendship thing that's super fun. And then I get my friendship love story movie where these two girls are so connected to one another that they are telepathically bound. And hey, because it's their way and they're totally down with it, consensually sometimes they make out and touch each other and that's totally cool. And you could have that in a friendship without it being a romantic relationship in your life because intimacy Mm -hmm. is a very big spectrum and it doesn't just have to mean the person you're fucking and they get to hear all your secrets and they're your one true companion and they're your other half of your heart. No, There's a lot of compartments that people can fit into. And so what this movie does is it actually gives a queer eye into female friendship that we so rarely see done with such nuance and respect and just wonderful humor while also giving us the fun genre aspects of it, which is why this movie gets to be a party too, where we get like a micro close-up on a makeout because as Karin and Diablo have said, this is also a, this is also a horror movie. This is a th- there is like that exploitation cinema bit of salacious fun that gets to creep into where it also gets to mm-hmm. be hot and it also gets to be sexy and it also gets to be fun and those things can coexist in an intimate, tender story of female friendship without being exploitative of that fact. They can be complementary to one another. They do not have to exist as mutually exclusive when watching a horror movie, when watching a genre picture. I mean, I. Literally speechless, <laughs> just nodding, nodding aggressively, which is, again, terrible podcast content. It can be a real, <laughs> real stem winder. So, yeah, it's a favorite topic. And it's a favorite topic. I can tell. It's glorious to listen. I can't wait for people to hear this. I wanted to wrap up the conversation around Jennifer's body mm-hmm. by asking, so what I found really interesting about the ending of the film is that it's as I've kind of been revisiting or rediscovering a lot of these female monstrous films one of the consistent tropes is that the monster always has to die at the end Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Uh, this is consistent not just with the monstrous feminine but kind of usually the monster does have to be defeated but what I find interesting is though Jennifer does die Mm -hmm. at the end the monstrosity lives on in Mm -hmm. Needy so technically Needy becomes the the monster yeah. and she lives on and she gets to escape as well in the final mm-hmm. scene um so i was wondering what your thoughts are in the ending and kind of what do you think this film says about female monstrosity on screen in my head like it's not it's not a fault that, with the film that, that jennifer dies i in my in my mm-hmm. head canon i in in a 2020 me i'm like maybe now jennifer could live if it got made and everything stayed the same but they just changed that one little bit i think what i like about what I don't, not like, what I accept, because I want Jennifer to live, what I accept <laughs> about it is that when you have that really embattled friendship, sometimes the only way to emancipate yourself from it is to cut it out entirely. And because this is a genre movie, the circumstances of cutting it out means means killing the monster, means killing the person. I, I don't think this undermines their story as Jennifer and Needy, because I think it's that thing of where, like, listen... Sometimes you got to say no, like not everybody can stay in your life forever. It actually is the healthier thing sometimes to to cut a person out of your life that is that is abusive or that is that is not a value add or that just makes your life harder or prevents you from growing and changing or that you're sort of so surgically bound to you actually can't be the best you while you're still attached to them. It's like it's a breakup like. They essentially Mm -hmm. had their ultimate breakup, but when you break up with someone in a horror movie, you kill them in a bed by stabbing them with a box knife, and they their monstrous form like deteriorates as their mom walks in and screams and finds you both there in in blood. So I, I but because like and what makes it work is the fact that the monstrous doesn't die, and that Mm -hmm. Jennifer's power becomes her monstrosity after her transformation. Her her monstrosity. She, you know, it's it's not an ideal way, but it's what keeps her, it's what gives her powers. It's what keeps her vital. It's what makes her the most radiant form of herself. And when that power passes on to Needy through, like, the injury she sustained from Jennifer, she, like, takes on qualities of the succubi, she, that enables her to break out of her mental institution prison that it gives her the ability to levitate it makes her stronger it makes her more agile it makes her more frightening and so we don't I don't think we know necessarily if she has shed if she is sort of like an evolution from it where she doesn't have to feed to live but maybe she just sort of like got the good stuff but doesn't have to take the murdery stuff with her but she is able to live her life she is able to live her life further on 
she, because of the monstrosity she monstrous quality she has taken on from her best friend and no doubt too like we and we know from the credit sequence that she goes on to get vengeance for Jennifer like regardless of everything that Jennifer did and killing Chip and <laughs> ruining her life in certain ways she still was like I'm gonna find those fuckers and I'm gonna kill them because they they took Jennifer from me they started all this and I'm not only like I already ended it because she's gone but you know what for spite, I'm just going to take those bitch ass boys out of the game because that's what they deserve. <laughs> and then she's going to go on living her life probably harder to catch, harder to kill, harder to pin down mm-hmm. because she is now embodies these qualities that she wouldn't be in possession of, you know, cost benefit analysis of it, of it all, but that she wouldn't be in possession of unless, without them having been imbued to her by Im- imbued into her by Jennifer. So it, it, the monstrosity comes with its give and take, which I think is a very, I like a, I like a revenge film where the person just rises at the end and like, but for being a bit beat up, they killed a million people and they came out, you know, alive and now they're going to go, you know, live their, live their life afterwards. Like that's totally fun, but there is a cost benefit to this. There does get to be a bargain. Like I accept that the monstrosity does not come with only unbridled power and beauty and energy and life, but it also comes with the fact that you have to make the choice. You have to you have to be okay with the fact that your ledger is going to be read in certain ways because we shouldn't view we shouldn't view power as something that just comes without limits or restrictions. Like responsibly, we shouldn't view power as just something we only lust for without any boundaries on it. So I like the perpetuation of the female monster even if she can't like walk off hand in hand with Jennifer into the sunset at the end of the day, I like the perpetuation of the female monster, even while the malignant form of that monstrosity had to be put down for the story, for Mm -hmm. the story to end. Like, yeah, Jennifer was going to keep abusing that shit. So like (laughs) needy, needy did what she had to do. But I think it's worth noting that in the process of killing the monster, when they have the the scene in the bed with the levitating and the fighting, the moment where Jennifer sort of relinquishes um, to needy the, where she sort of gives way in the fight is when she when needy pulls the locket from her neck when she pulls the biff necklace off yes and that yeah. you see you know Megan kind of you see Jennifer kind of relent and start falling backwards and as she collapses into the bed mm-hmm. the like needy falls down and plunges the knife into her chest and you see the best friend necklace like tumbling and fall to the ground. And like the most, the, the thing that has been most deeply severed in that moment is their friendship. Like that's the heartbreak. That's the thing that for all of her posturing gets Jennifer to submit or shocks her enough mm-hmm. into sort of a moment of sobriety to like lose track of the fight and sort of lose her strength. And when she loses Needy, she loses her power. She, lo- she Like for that moment, she loses the strength. To sort of fight back. Mm -hmm. And that's an incredible, that's an incredible fucking metaphor. And as Diablo has said in interviews before, when Needy stabs her and Jennifer says like, ow, my tit. And Needy says to her, no, your heart. Like that is, that is, that gets to the heart of, that gets to the core of what Cody wanted to convey, which is like, we're going to make like tits jokes in this and we're going to laugh and we're going to have the Jennifer speak. But at the end of this, this is about the heart of it. And the heart of this is Jennifer and Needy. And by leaving you, by breaking up with you, by killing you, like, I'm breaking your heart. And then they, you know, Jennifer dies on the bed and it's a whole mess. But <laughs> that is, like, I cry watching the end of that because it's just so good. <laughs> and it, like, the <laughs> you don't get things that revere, you don't get things that are that much fun and that crazy that and are that, mm. like, good looking that revere that kind of love story so much, hardly ever. Mm -hmm. And that it came in 2009, you know, kind of a full decade before we considered those conversations as valid ones that we should be having more often in like mainstream culture criticism circles. That is so goddamn impressive. Like what they did was so goddamn impressive. (laughs) And, you know, you fucked up the marketing Fox Atomic, you know, RAP Fox Atomic, but thanks for getting, thanks for being hands off while they were making this movie and letting them put out the product that they intended to, to create that still blows my mind to this day. 
despite all the terrible marketing and the terrible release, the film itself is intact and we can still watch it and we can still access it. Yeah, and the thing, and the thing, like when when these interviews happen, you don't hear the creators behind it saying, "This isn't the movie we intended to make." They they got they actually got to make the movie they wanted to make. It saw the world in the way that it was supposed to, and mm-hmm. it, it's shocking that for a company that that so mismanaged. Um, and so misunderstood what it was that they actually just let it happen. That was a wonderful dissection of <laughs> Jennifer's body. Great! I'm so happy. Moving on to All Cheerleaders Die from 2013. My treasure, my gem, All Cheerleaders Die. I love you <laughs> so much. Welcome to the squad, bitch. <laughs> A crazy friggin' dream. All four of you died last night. You don't feel anything about this? Is it our fault chicks can't drive for shit? What did you do? Freaking fantastic. Yes, so exquisite. Something like evil would miss for wrong visit. This is not what you used to. Boys be dogs, girls be bitches. Gangster. When is this? Mr. Big Bad Wolf himself. I'm gonna ruin your perfect little senior year. There's only one outcome when people play games with me, Maddie. They lose. My time's over, Terry. I mean, I'm not going to ask if you like this movie or not, because you, you, <laughs> but what is your relationship with the film? Because there is an earlier, very, very low budget version, which is like Lucky McKee's first, I believe, stab at feature filmmaking from 2001, which is not a version I have seen, I have mm-hmm. to admit. But and then this came out in 2013. And I always find it really fascinating when filmmakers revisit and remake their own stuff um, because the first stab at it did not reach the expectations that they potentially did not have the resource uh-huh. or the industry cloud to make the film that they wanted mm-hmm. to make. So what is your relationship with both versions of All Cheerleader Stop? I honestly, I've not seen the short either. I've not seen the short either. And I only knew about it after the fact of having seen it. And mm-hmm. I, when I heard that it, like the, the short came out so long ago, like the early 2000s, I, it made me yeah. like, it made me like the movie. It made me like ex- happy about Lucky McKee even more. Cause it was like, you made that short a full day decade before you made all cheerleaders die you made the short you made other movies Mm -hmm. you 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 created other things but you were like no i have to go back to all cheerleaders die and now that i'm in a position with some more with some actual resources to make this Mm -hmm. thing as i as i envisioned it existing initially i i have not been able to let it go all this time and now that I've arrived a little bit I'm gonna make the all cheerleaders die that I've intended to make I love that commitment to the cause <laughs> so much it de- it delights me to no end because anybody who wants to make like their queer weird like teen girl teen like cheerleader zombie movie and they're like and I just can't get it out of my head you follow that dream. You follow that dream forever. <laughs> Bless you for that. I I have to admit, I hadn't seen this film in a, in a while. And I love Lucky McKee's work. I think May is probably... May and his episode of Masters of Horror, Sick mm-hmm. Girl, also with Angela Bettis, is probably two of my favorite um, genre uh, pieces mm-hmm. of work I've ever seen. Um, in my head, I had a completely different memory of this film. <laughs> there was much less crystal business going on in my head. I mainly focused on the on the zombie cheerleaders. Yeah, yeah. No, <laughs> this movie is distinctly two movies. And that aspect of it is a whole aspect where it's like, oh, shit. 
That is going on the entire time this movie gets crazy. (laughs) Wow. So what do you think about the blend of, uh, like, beyond the the different archetypes of Mm -hmm. high school power structures, including the jocks, the cheerleaders, the weirdos, the emo kids, and the the Wicca girl. What do you think of the merge of witch, zombie, possession, and also, like, yeah, witch, zombie, possession, horror films that all cheerleaders die is as a as a maximalist i love the fact that this movie is doing it all like not not every movie has to do it all but here's the thing is like Mm. this movie came out in 2013 i saw it like on accident i was like zombie cheerleaders this is cool like i i had no i had no pre-awareness of the movie I had no assumptions mm-hmm. about it and just like got my whole life over the course of watching it. Shouts out to Caitlin Stacy, queer icon, um, keeping us all up nights. Uh, I want it like I I'm a, a big fan of like what A24 is doing over there. Mm-hmm. And they, they've done a lot uh, for, for, the, for the branding of the genre to kind of bring on a new set of horror fans. It's so muted. A24 is so credibility, so credible and so respected and so beautiful and so artistic, but it, it's very polished and it's it's very like it, it has a lot of focus and a lot of intention and mm-hmm. and not that like a movie like All Cheerleaders Die does not have focus of it or intention, but it says like it's more of a yes and mentality. It's more of a little yes and way of putting a movie together. And sometimes I want the yes and. Like, sometimes I want the hot fudge sundae because it's got the nuts and the caramel <laughs> and the chocolate and the cherry and the whipped cream. Like, every once in a while, that is the layered treat that I want. And I need these things to exist in contrast to, like, the impossible single emotion of a movie like It Comes at Night to be like, all right, that was definitely a time. Uh, but now I would like to watch zombies created by witchcraft in a movie about <laughs> high school sex and social politics uh, with cheerleaders. So let's have that. You know, for our UK listeners, it's a trifle yeah. of zombie <laughs> yeah. cheerleader movies. It is a trifle of zombie <laughs> cheerleader movies. And I like rewatching it recently. A friend of mine for I think it's like 10 or maybe 15 years at this point, every uh, every weekend he does a double feature and has movie night. When when before COVID, mm-hmm. we did that in person. Now he takes it online. He does it virtually. Sam, I love you. He, for my birthday, he does birthday editions for, for his frequent attendees. For my birthday, the programmed double was, bless him, Sorority <laughs> Row from 2000, yes. yeah, from, was that 2006 and All Cheerleaders Die. And I, it was like four of the best hours a person could spend in their entire life. <laughs> and I was, I was having so much fun. And then we got into All Cheerleaders Die and I hadn't watched it in a minute. And I had completely somehow blocked out the like shared orgasm sex scene that happens. Yes. <laughs> and I had also blocked it out. And like, I I didn't have a bad memory of it, but I was like, I fully fucking forgot this happened. And I was like, the audacity of this movie (laughs) after the zombie cheerleader resurrection, where they have entered the school to scare the shit out of the jocks and get their revenge. We are now learning that the mind melt resulting from their shared resurrection where they each have a like a crystal embedded in their body that is powering them overseen by the Wicca played by Catherine Smith McPhee. It means that they all experience like the same sensation at the same time. So the virginal girl has been swapped into her sister who is now going to fuck the boy she's been having a crush on in the school bathroom and each of these girls in different parts of located on different parts of the school grounds are now going to publicly orgasm in front of the student body and nobody is going to have any idea what is going on until after the fact i was like oh my god that's just a that's just a thing that happens in this movie it's just one thing (laughs) that happens in this movie and somehow 
I don't know how I don't know how Lucky McKee did this. I don't know how he mo- he made a movie that felt so classically like nodding to TNA of like old exploitation movies while not making hmm. me feel shitty at any point. I did not I do not feel shitty or gross watching all cheerleaders die. It feels and I hope it's true, it feels like the agree like it feels like everybody is in on it this pact was made and all these actresses working in concert with lucky were like this is what we're here for we are proud and pleased and consenting to do this we are like there's that great shot where um like the blonde head cheerleader has realized that she has an mm-hmm. unquenchable thirst so she in her tiny white underwear walks to the neighbor's house where she's going to eventually eat him. And on the way of her walking down the street, the camera angle we get is right behind her left ass cheek as she is just like stomping down the suburban road. And yet somehow I was like, I don't know how this doesn't feel like an exploitative mess, but it doesn't. And she somehow manages to drink a whole gallon of milk in front of the neighbor that she's about to eat. And it's still in her underwear and it still does not feel gross. I mean, I say this with the utmost respect for Lucky McKee because I do love, love, love his work. It feels like this film was made by those teenage zombie cheerleaders. Yes, it does. As opposed to a grown genre filmmaker. And I say this in the best possible way because you're right. It does not feel gross. It doesn't feel exploitative despite very clearly taking all of the batshit crazy but also super fun aspects of exploitation horror. Uh Uh-huh. It manages to handle the two kisses between, the three kisses between the, 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 Mm. you know, emergently queer female characters in the movie. And Mm -hmm. they too, like, like that Jennifer's body kiss, it feels, it is, it is hot. It is sexy. It is, it is done in a way that like, this is very attractive. This, this is, this is an arousing scene. It doesn't feel like the camera ever hangs too long in the wrong place. It doesn't feel Mm -hmm. like the intention of the scene from the from the person making it is to be like, is that he lost track of himself and he just sort of gave into like this male fantasy. The scene between um, the two girls in the car when one of them is like Terry's an asshole. I mean, like like the girl the the Mm -hmm. you know I'm forgetting their characters' names and I'm just remembering. I'm just remembering their actress names right now, but it's a uh, uh, Maddie, Maddie, Maddie and Tracy, um, Maddie, who is like scheming against all these cheerleaders and she's going to get vengeance um, because like her best friend died in this like cheer accident. And also because the head cheerleader, like because Tracy's boyfriend, the head of the football team raped her, which we will find out over the course mm-hmm. of the movie. She's got this multi-pronged vengeance plot. She's trying to break up Tracy from Terry, the the shitty, evil, evil ass high school player. Mm-hmm. And so she's just getting her to break up with a shitty guy. Like that's ultimately like the right thing she should be doing, but she's lying to her about why. And Tracy, drunk, seeks comfort in Maddie. And Maddie has been dating like Lena. Maddie's been dating the Wicca girl for some time prior mm-hmm. to this. So everybody knows she's queer and like she gets kind of some shit for it in, in a way that's like believably high school it's like yeah like mm-hmm. i would like a utopia where this is just where we all are and we didn't need labels and everybody could just exist but like this the fact that it's not like an othering kind of queerness it's just like yeah this is like shitty high school like bully people and the, the people who are calling this out about her in the way that they are we are meant to designate them as bad people so when mm-hmm. tracy seeks comfort in maddie they have this kiss in in Tracy's car in a way that just felt very authentic to the young girl like exploring sexuality landscape. It was like, yeah, this is tenderness. There is a vulnerability here. This mm-hmm. girl is scared. She's a little bit drunk. This girl, they're both pretty. This girl is listening. She's allowing her to be vulnerable in front of her. She's creating a safe space. It's like, mm-hmm. what if I kiss this person? Like, this is how I know to feel comfort. This is how I know to feel closeness. Like, what if, what if we just made out right now? There is something that is very refreshing to just see normalized in a normalized about that in a way that doesn't feel icky and that the girls have a mm-hmm. sort of moment together on the sidewalk afterwards where they just kind of like have a post kiss moment of sort of bonding with one another where they, they come to an understanding and they, and they have like a moment of friendship. It, the surrounding mm-hmm. context of the, the kiss scenes in this movie do so much to authenticate 
the genuine focus on the narrative purpose of it and the, its aspect in character development, that it makes it feel like it's not opportunistic. Similarly, when you have Tracy and the Maddie mm-hmm. and Tracy and Maddie of the Woods, like we lead up to a sex scene between them. And I'm not saying that like you can't have like a, a sex scene between these two characters because it would be inheritive, inherently taking advantage of them or or putting sex on screen in a way that was unnecessary or just they're only for prurient interest. But if you don't, if you're if it's not done exactly right, it can be really icky and bad. And the fact that this movie pulls out right before Tracy and Maddie have sex with each other in the woods, I was like, okay, respectful mm-hmm. doff of the cap to the fact that we didn't need to see these girls naked. We didn't need to see mm-hmm. them further undressing to understand what was going to happen. And the fact that there is a overt acknowledgement of consent in that moment between Tracy and Maddie, where obviously like Maddie's a bit more out. Tracy's never done anything like this before with a girl. And mm-hmm. we like there's like a Foley effect added where we hear the theoretically the unzipping of of Tracy's pants and she mm-hmm. gets a little bashful for a moment. She kind of like recoils back a little bit and Maddie looks at her and she's like, is this OK? And Tracy's like, ignore, like Tracy, like gives the yes by like leaning in and kissing her, and allows the moment to go forward. And you know, there's a there's an emphasis on Tracy is giving herself over to Maddie because yes, they're they're really hot, they're attracted to each other. But at the same time, she's like, why are you being so nice to me? No one's ever been so nice to me. And it's a horror movie. There's manipulation going on and lying. But the connection between the two of them, which is we see later on Maddie is conflicted about eventually lying to Tracy because she has come to care for her and she has come to like her. And mm. so that betrayal does bite both of them in the ass later on because they they shared something genuine between the two of them. The emphasis on the fact that these two are emotionally, actually, sincerely connecting with one another. And that has become the bedrock of why they're hooking up right now. Even even though there are like there are games afoot uh, and the fact that there is consent worked into that moment too, amidst the emphasis on like the emotional connectivity between these two characters, that is exactly how you do this responsibly. That is exactly how you put consent in a story. And it's not this awkward thing where it's like, and now we're going to look at the camera and it's going to PS- be a PSA moment about how to do consent responsibly. No, consent can be sexy. Consent can be easy and fluid and a natural part of the story. And it's something that Adam Egypt Mortimer just did really well in the movie Daniel Isn't Real as well. There was a very natural organic mm-hmm. progression of a sex scene. There is an overt like re- like request and acknowledgement of consent like that this this is how easy it is and this is how it can actually like make a scene better and sexier and more substantial by putting that in what do you make of maddie as her protagonist i truly love her (laughs) (laughs) he is essentially also living in a whole third movie that exists within ultra later style which is her own rape revenge narrative i i i mean caitlin stacy just endless endless claps for Caitlin Stacy who brought such a perfect swaggering like alpha queer energy to her role that made <laughs> yeah. her scheme so believable in its execution it's sort of like certain people just kind of have that power certain certain people men and women they just have that energy where they like they can mm-hmm. make you think their idea was your idea and you could like i again as a as a panoramic gray asexual person i am i am very I am very drawn to people. I am very attracted to people. I am, I experience very desirous feelings of people. It just doesn't go to mm-hmm. the threshold of sex for me. But there is, I do experience that covetousness. I do experience that feeling of like, I want to be wanted and I want to be pulled in by these magnetic people. I want mm-hmm. to be charmed and seduced by sort of the magnetism of, of very charismatic individuals. I think that the type of charisma that you're I think you're describing is what some people at a very brief moment on the internet were referring to as big dick energy. Yes, you are right. I choose to refer to it as Kate Blanchett <laughs> energy because that is the exact same level of just exact. all-consuming magnetism and power that is completely undefinable and just manifests itself fully when it, when a human actually has it. Yeah, no, and, and that is, that's a very real thing. That's a very real thing that exists that people succumb to. And that it's something that I enjoy succumbing to. I'm like, yes, this is wonderful. Let's engage in this dynamic together. You be the fire, I'll be the air. I'll just keep feeding you. And this will be just a glorious symbiosis. And Caitlin Stacy brings so much of that swagger to this role. You can see how she can put people in her hand and get them to do what she wants and how she can sort of mm. get Tracy, you know, e- e- eating out of her hand as, as the way she does. But what I, it's, it's, 
it's amazing that again for all the, the this movie could be such a mess if some if it was not handled so responsibly in all of its in all of the versions of narrative that exist in it and I thought mm. for as somebody who also like I really like rape revenge movies it's always a weird thing to say but I find a lot of value in them particularly in the sort of neo-exploitation wave that I see emergent right now with some mm-hmm. films like The Nightingale and MFA and The Perfection and um movies that really take this something that is so historically the most problematic kind of movie and really tip the scales on in, in the movie revenge specifically that really tip the scales into pulling away from exploitation and moving actually more into empowerment fully and being stylized and being beautiful and showing us that we can have these kinds of stories that do not actually glorify and sensationalize and center the rapes in the way that they historically do in movies like you know traditionally i spit on your grave and miss 45 and things like that miss 45 which mm-hmm. i love um, and in this movie, the rape as, the rape part of the story comes in like halfway through when we realize what, mm-hmm. what QB1 Terry did to Maddie, like in their moment of mutual mourning for her dead best friend over the summer. And mm-hmm. this movie it alone should get spoken about more frequently for its incredibly visceral and terrifying portrayal of rape culture. Like, for the sheer villainy that radiates off of Terry. Like, the cruelness and the callousness coming off of Tom Williamson in this is so... Like, we were watching it at movie night, like I said, and, you know, we have fun Mm -hmm. and we're in the chat and we're, like, making jokes the whole time. And then that scene comes up where Tracy and Terry are squaring off after her and Maddie have had sex in the Mm -hmm. woods and she's emasculating him in front of his friends and she's tearing him down and he punches her. And you see the light go off in his eyes. Suddenly everybody was like, this is, this is act like we're making, we were making jokes 15 seconds ago. This is harrowing. I am Mm. terrified. This is chilling. Some people hadn't seen it. They were like, I'm genuinely upset Mm. right now. Where's this going to go? And, and no one says anything. Yeah. The culture of complicity around him from his boys and and the the mm. women screaming at him like is this are you gonna let him get away with this is this what is this like this is your friend this is what you're gonna stand here and watch and the to watch him what that culminates and they die because he drives them off a road in road rage like they run from him because they're terrified like the girl's been like tra- tracy's been punched she's on the ground the girls are terrified everybody runs the guys chase them down he runs them off the road they die they are resurrected as zombies the fact that we know he killed them before we know that he raped Maddie, I think is a perfect sort of light bulb moment where when you, it's not, in a, it wasn't an irrational moment. Terry wasn't overcome by his feelings. He didn't do something mm. that was out of character when he killed these girls, when he punched Tracy. He didn't do something that didn't make any sense within the context of who Terry is. No, we learn later that he raped Maddie. There's a clear like and and we the scene plays out in such a way to where it is visceral and it is upsetting and it is heinous, but it doesn't languish. The camera does not stay. We don't sit and watch like we don't have to watch the life drain from Maddie's eyes as consent is ripped away from her and her body is violated. It is cut Mm -hmm. very, I think, respectfully in a way to convey the impact and the severity of the moment while not exploiting the visual of the rape itself. And it's we we see there that oh this is this is who he is through and through that the, a person capable of per- perpetrating this kind of violence against someone a person capable of this kind of heinous violence against a woman that's not too far of a logic leap from thinking he could consider their lives so invaluable as to just discard them entirely and kill them it's it's a fundamental devaluing of life it's a fundamental devaluing of women as as not being worthy human beings not being human beings at all perhaps and i think too that what this movie does really this what this movie hints at really well like it doesn't it doesn't dwell on it because it's it's not the story it's trying to tell but there's such a moodiness to maddie's character and she's so withdrawn and she's so upset and you're like wow she's really upset at the death of her friend like she's this is you know she's getting she's getting vengeance on behalf of this girl she is but also she's traumatized this girl is this girl is shattered in the wake of a sexual assault and the ways in which she has been driven to an extreme measure the ways in which she has convinced herself that it is acceptable for her to manipulate and lie to these people in order to achieve her ends of an ultimately like bringing terry down it is an all-consuming world-changing life-altering kind of trauma a, a rape 
And the fact that, and Caitlin Stacy plays that character with amazing big dick energy, but she also very subtly plays it throughout the entire time of somebody who is hurting. And then we learn the impetus of that hurt and we understand how deeply it radiates down to her core. And that is a really surprisingly thing to be able to sneakily put inside of a movie with witchcraft, zombies, cheerleaders in their underwear, like gay sex, and like four girls sharing an orgasm while one of them eats a boy in a van in the parking lot. Like, what a tightrope! What a juggling act! All cheerleaders (laughs) must die manages to pull off and it's like it's like 90 minutes long it's not like we're with this movie for three hours all of this happens in like an hour and a half jesus <laughs> i mean i find it impressive that you managed to fit all of those things in into a sentence on a podcast it's what i'm imagine saying fitting all of that into 90 minutes of a feature film uh, i can't even i can't imagine <laughs> writing that script and at a certain point not just like scribbling in crayon and throwing it at people and being like we'll figure it out as we go <laughs> fuck like literally that that's that's the reaction I think everyone would get after watching this movie. <laughs> and I do encourage people to seek it out. It's also widely available in the UK. It's on Amazon Prime. Yeah, it's, it's, it's like it's, right there. It might be on both Amazon Prime and Netflix in the US. Like there mm. are multiple ways you can watch this with streaming services you likely are already paying for. And it's so fun. God. <laughs> There's an interesting point that you bring up kind of um, just a little bit before, which is kind of with all of these things happening that are thrown at us and thrown at the story. What do you think all cheerleaders die is ultimately about kind of what is the story at the heart of the film that is trying to say do you think i there is one thing i have to say about because this again spoilery get spoilery um <laughs> the final showdown is between terry and wicca girl lena and their he has summoned he like all the cheerleaders have been re-killed he has mm-hmm. summoned their crystals from them somehow. I forget specifically how. they. Have- he tears them out and then he eats them. Yeah, he physically... Yeah, it's not any more artful than that. Terry physically <laughs> rips the crystals from their corpses and eats them. He is now a supercharged, Wicca-powered version of his evil self... In a, we're in a graveyard. All this is happening. It's, mm-hmm. it's monster Terry fighting witch Lena... And there's like a great battle and he gets ripped apart and he dies. And in a furious fit, Lena panics because Maddie's her ex and she's been obsessed with her Mm -hmm. this entire movie. This is the point that I'm getting at. My one big problem with all cheerleaders die is the fact that Lena gets Maddie back in the end. Because Lena is a 100% just gender swapped, obsessive teen boy character in a, in a high school comedy who through force of stalking and relentless inability to listen to the object of his affection or read her social cues finally wins her over in the end with his illegal levels of devotion to her. Lena is that. Lena isn't even like a kind of like a more like we changed things to make her like a girl. Ver- no, she's just that character, that toxic ass character. And the fact that Tracy like dies in a series of bear traps and Lena gets to win Maddie back by like showing up at her house and not letting her move on and like being real creepy and obsessive about. No, no. No, no, no. The lesson of all in like, like she brings, she's screaming, screaming bloody agony over, over um, Maddie's body, trying to bring her back, trying to resurrect her, like, you know, magically, magically bring her back to life again, which works. And Maddie throws herself into Lena's arms when it's like, bitch, this is your toxic ex. This is not your happy <laughs> ending. Break up with her, go off to college, get a restraining order, and, like, maybe that means she kills you because you won't be with her, but then we just know that she wouldn't allow you to live unless you were living in her arms, which is fucked up, and, like, no, no, that's not the moral of this story that I want. That's not what this movie's about, but it is a, it is a not favorite note that it goes out on. That that's a very good point. Lena is a Wicca version of Floyd Dobler, and yes. just because she's a girl, it doesn't mean it's good. It does not make it okay. Like, yeah, she Maddie gets to be mad at you 
Lena, when you show up outside your house being mm-hmm. like, you wouldn't talk to me. It's like, that doesn't mean come over. And like yeah. in the sex scene with Tracy, she's like spying on her from a perch up in the woods, looking at her ex, fuck this girl on the cheerleading team and like crying over her crystals. It's like, this is, is single white female shit. This is not romantic. This is not aspirational. A lesson we should take from All Cheerleaders Die is that just because that's a girl does not make it okay. But I think ultimately, what I like to take, what I like, I think what the ultimate work that this movie is doing, like in addition Mm -hmm. to the, like, you know what, it can be fun. It can be maximalist. Yeah. It can be out of hand. It can be these things that I think we would consider lowbrow or trashy, but be actually strung together in a really mm-hmm. delicate way. That means you can you can you can have you can be party in the front and have sort of business in the back, like sort of reverse mullet situation, <laughs> where like we kind of do get to take our medicine in this movie of seeing how you can you can do the work of being a kind of ally creator actually and like the, the i you know I, I love the idea of this movie was made by a woman i love it more actually that it's made by a guy because mm-hmm. we, i can't thanos male filmmakers out of existence um that's not something i can do much as i wish we could suspend them for like 5 years um <laughs> we need we need men to do it right we need men mm-hmm. to be caught up with us. We need men to be in conversation with us about these things. We need it to look like, we need we need it to, like, this movie does look like the writer-director was working in concert with his female stars and being like, mm-hmm. how do we feel about this? How's this going to go? I would really love to talk to Lucky McKee about, like, the sort of conversation process between him and his actresses because it, it is it is kind of, like, at points it does become a low-key skin flick. Not 100%, but just a little bit in kind of fun ways. I would love to know about the conversations about, like, comfort levels and safety levels it's seven years ago, in 2013, at a time when we weren't talking mm-hmm. about, you know, contract stipulations to, like, make sets more diverse or, you know, you know um, intimacy coordinators on set. And that is what we need. It can't just be women telling men what to do. It needs to be men doing it right on their own. Or this doesn't get better. It doesn't become sustainable change in the industry where men can teach other men. Men can provide an example for other men to follow. And I think that the way that this movie has very sort of fetishistic very sort of fetishy set pieces that be considered like kind of dude fantasies, but that are also Mm -hmm. like hot, you know, fantasies for like, you know, maybe straight girls who just like looking and maybe queer girls who are like, that looks awesome. I want to participate in that. Like you want to know that men can responsibly handle these things too, that because like, and it doesn't mean all women will handle them responsibly either, but it is nice to know that when you see a guy's name in the writer director slot, you don't have to inherently go, Mm -hmm. Oh God, I hope he doesn't fuck this up. Like, because you're just kind of waiting for it to be fucked up every time. And given the focus of Lucky's work so much on on movies about women, on movies about young women, on movies about girls and their, you know, friendships and intimacy and how consistently he has handled that with um, with dignity and uh, and a respectful eye. It, it, it clearly seems like it's something like with me, like you said, and, and with mm-hmm. The Woods starring Agnes Bruckner and Patricia Clarkson and and with this movie. It's clearly something that he's executing consistently well enough to be like, oh, you didn't just get lucky. You didn't accident your way into handling mm-hmm. these very tricky, um, intimate scenes well. You, you, you seem to have a handle on this. And it seems to actually be an important thing to you to continually get right and do, do with dignity. So that's, I think that's something, that's a takeaway. I, it's not like a, a thing that you would get unless you like read between the lines or you were interested in doing research mm-hmm. on it. But I think a takeaway from All Cheerleaders Die is that, we can take our medicine and we can have our dessert. We can we can have the Sunday. We can have the trifle. And we don't actually have to feel like garbage about it afterwards. Like there there is a future in which neo-exploitation can be done in a way that is respectful, can be done in a way that is big and brash and not all the way politically correct. And you can have fun with trash. And that it doesn't have to be mutually exclusive. It does not have to be highbrow acceptable lowbrow watch with the shades down you can have it all i'm gonna get that tattooed you can have fun with trash because <laughs> yeah. that's gonna be my new <laughs> life motto god damn right and my friend sam and his, my sam weinman director sam weinman and his wonderful movie nights he I, he would he if he were next to me right now we would both just be yelling that at you into this microphone and i want to carry our ethos forward loudly and proudly
damn right. This is going to be a <laughs> chunky episode, but <laughs> god damn it, I cannot, I cannot press stop. It's just too good. <laughs> I like to think I'm, I'm at least an entertaining person to listen to. So I'm oh, very, I'm, ba- I'm very big in all of this. I'm very big. We, we, we started kind of this conversation about both of these films under the, the slightly flippant banner of kind of murder cheerleaders. Mm-hmm. But how do you think these films are in conversation with each other? Jennifer's Body and Old Cheerleaders Die. I I think they, you know, as you said, the cheerleader canon, but they both, they they both give us that sense of being able to have the Sunday. They both give us that sense of being able to, listen, you can just check in with this movie and you can have fun with exactly what's in front of you. You can, you can enjoy it entirely and then leave and be like, I I never want to have a long conversation about that movie, but I had a great time. Or... If you want to engage in the conversation about the movie, which is which is something that horror, obviously, for time immemorial is is built for. Mm-hmm. But in the context of of these movies specifically, they give us a fun point into a conversation that I think Trojan horses itself particularly well to sort of the, you know, I think what can be very, very reductively described as like film bros or like horror bros who think that maybe movies have movies are too you know you, you see everyone's well it's it's not it's not the consensus but there is certainly a vocal portion of, of genre male genre fan who think that oh, for sure the the, yeah. the 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 genre is watered down it's too afraid it's it's too safe now it it doesn't take chances it, these aren't movies for grown-ups there there needs to be boobs there needs to be more blood it's like people who kind of want the 80s back Mm-hmm. But without be, and not and they 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 say they 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 purport to want that back because it's more fun and it, it gives the filmmaker more freedom and it, it's a it's a greater expression of honest art. But what they mm. so what's what many not all what many of those people who long for those days want back is the lack of responsibility to give a shit about the meaning of what they're making and the lack of responsibility to give a shit about the fact that more people have voices now that are weighing in on the discourse. More people have fought their way to seats at the table and more perspectives are finally starting to be considered valid in these conversations. Trans rights, rights of queer folks, black trans folks, like all the these, these people that have been so acutely marginalized from pop culture generally and, you know, from horror in ways that because it is a genre of violence, the ways in which people who are marginalized are left out of it or are, or are done dirty on screen is the fact that like, mm-hmm. it's, it's not just a matter of them not being there. We, it's people having to watch their bodies being abused. It, it, like it, it's having to watch the black character always die first. It's having to watch bury your gaze. It's having to watch mm-hmm. trans characters be monstrous inherently. So it's not just like they're not even there. It's it's they're it's asked, the way they're there. Yeah, it's the way they're there, and the way that they're asked to consider representation in the worst forms. It's like, well, aren't you just happy to be here? It's like, well, I'm a killer only. That sucks. Like, I I don't want the the reality of who I am to make me inherently expendable or inherently monstrous. And not that monstrosity is bad. Monstrosity, like monsters, get shit done. Monsters make an impression. <laughs> monsters are going to get through that door, even if it is fucking closed. We will break through. So it is not something to be inherently vilified. But I think that the way these these two movies are vitally in conversation with each other is that, okay, have your fun, but know that if you're gonna if you're going to peel back the layer, which I hope you do, this will challenge your status quo. This will force you to consider perspectives outside of the cis white male hegemony that has defines everything in this country. And force you to be like, well, you know, if you want to talk about Jennifer's body, we can't sit here and talk about it earnestly without talking about feminism, without talking about queer horror, without talking about mm-hmm. misogyny. And yes, without talking about the utter omission of, of black folks from this, con- black and brown folks from this conversation. They haven't come up at all. Like the only, the, like Terry, Tom Williamson does an incredible job in All Cheerleaders mm-hmm. Die. He's, he's, it's an incredible villain turn. He's the only black character, I think, in that movie. Yes, these movies mm-hmm. are absolutely insufficient when it comes to adequate representation of, of, mm-hmm. ra- of racial diversity. Absolutely. I, I will champion their queerness all day long, but I will recognize the ways in which they fall short. And I think that's an, a vital part of how we talk about this, too, 
And that mm-hmm. that is that has to be the distinction of where we are now in 2020 versus where we've ever been before is being able to celebrate while critiquing is being able to say that because I love you, I ask you to be better because I treasure you so much because you are so important to me, X movie or X genre broadly. I, I also must ask that you do not exist in your status quo. And I think these movies do a really fun job of being really playful while challenging that status quo and in ways that because they're because they're so good particularly with Jennifer's body is so fucking good um and all cheerleaders die is so fucking good but Jennifer's body is next level it's not it's not a critique to say you're not as good as Jennifer's body because it's just like one of the best movies ever made but (laughs) it's like it it is so it it, they're these movies that are so like almost alienatingly feminine and so Mm -hmm. alienatingly perhaps to some um female in their ambitions and their intent and their presentation and in their aesthetic like there's something sort of inherently queer about their aesthetic um i hope that it makes i hope that these two movies programmed of a, as a double bill would make those sort of intractable forces of nostalgia pissed off and not because that's the way to progress but because there is a certain sect that's not trying to grow there is a certain sect of of people who's who's not trying to like advance the conversation and just think it's shitty and politically correct and boring to to try and put a uh, put a meaning where they think one shouldn't exist. Mm-hmm. No, I, I I want you to feel like some things aren't for you because some things aren't for me either. I don't get to just like dive into Twitter conversations between friends because I think their jokes are good and be like, hey guys, I'm here now too. I don't get to dive into a conversation between two black people about blackness in America and act like I have a fucking thing to say about that. No, not everything belongs to everyone. But for things that don't belong to you, engage in in things that are things that are this fun I think they invite the conversations about what does and does not belong to you and how you can participate in conversations around cultural products and educate yourself on them without horning your way and centering yourself in the middle in a way that is an act of violence against the intended audience and the creators themselves like I, I hope that I I see these two movies like obviously they're they're superficially very joined with their you know literal elements but I hope what we can share about them in conversation is exactly what we've been talking about here. Like you mm-hmm. said, the female monster, what qualifies as a monster, what monstrosity allows for us to do in the face of a society that wants to both, as women, turn us into objects for their use, but discard us as soon as we become too threatening. Like, I hope that that these movies can give us the great big, loud, colorful door opening into something where we suddenly accidentally found ourselves sitting in a little lecture hall, but we didn't realize it because we were having so much fun. But oh my God, we mm. learned something and we didn't even realize it. I hope that is the is the deepest connective tissue between two movies like this. That's a fantastic way to connect them. And also tantamount female, female intimacy, friendship tantamount to uh, being a, a muddy, complex and wonderfully kaleidoscopic zone of of what intimacy can mean that is not strictly defined in terms of just friends or your romantic partner, significant other, soulmate. That that those two relationships, those two kinds of relationships can exist tantamount to one another in our social hierarchical structures. And to finalize our conversation about both of these, to bring it back to All Cheerleaders Die for a brief second, do you hope there's a sequel given the Carrie-esque ending? Yes, lucky! lucky come on come on it's been set you took more than a decade between your short and your feature to get that made we are not even that long yet away from all cheerleaders die we were kind of promised a sequel it said you like it said to be continued it said like you know that's it for now I am so okay with even waiting a couple more years to maybe it's like you make an all cheerleaders die each decade I don't know but like please fulfill this dream of of mine of ours of so many who are and you know and if it can be if it can be caitlin stacy again that would be super cool i would be totally down with that. <laughs> I, but like you know i just want us all i want us all to be able to go back into this world in in a way that i'd be so interested to know what a 2020 a continuation mm-hmm. of the story looks like with the world having changed in the ways that it has and the way we talk about movies having changed in the ways that it has and, and Lucky having been like a, a, a seemed like a pretty good ally mm-hmm. for a long time now I would love to know with the sort of discourse unleashed as it is now what 
this movie could do further. Not that it has to do more or aim higher, but that it just like maybe could even have a little more room to roam mm. than it did the first time. So I would, I would love to know. I would like to see it. And I would like to know what a zombie Alexis does and who exactly killed her because that was not an accidental drop. <laughs> yeah. That is my own little conspiracy theory about old cheerleaders die. There was some dirt going on there. Yeah, and she is in rough shape and I would love to see her take the world by storm. <laughs> so it just, oh, I just want it. I want it so much. <laughs> Jordan, thank you so much for all of your time and your incredible insight. I have no fucking clue how I'm going to edit this down. This is going to have to be a two hour podcast. <laughs> and you know what? Everyone should be grateful. I thank you for letting me just uh, go on and on as I tend to do. It's been incredible. Um, Jordan, when can people find out more about your work online? And do you have anything coming up that you want to plug? Yeah, yeah. I uh, You can find me on Twitter at Jorcru, J-O-R-C-R-U. And uh, there I will be, you know, talking about any old thing. But uh, I have a Patreon where I write. And you are welcome to both find that and subscribe and give me money. Patreon.com slash Cruciola. And along with the sort of independent uh, works, there are a couple podcasts out there, too. There is my Disaster Girls podcast that I do with my co-host and friend Amanda Smith, where we just talk about disaster movies and how much we love them. Uh, we dreamcast them. We talk about their deep core meanings. Amanda really likes to a death of God narrative um, <laughs> in disaster movies. We really plumb the depths of, of psychology for those. And then uh, we currently have out uh, me and another uh, two writer friends, Alana Bennett and Christina Grace Tucker, uh, all of us uh, queers on the internet, talking entirely across a miniseries of podcasts about uh, a miniseries podcast called A Simple Podcast, where we only talk about the movie A Simple Favor. And uh, we actually got... Paul Feig on an episode. He uh, went along with us on an interview. If you love A Simple Favor and you too have been waiting for that movie to be honored properly, then listen to A Simple Podcast. So a handful of things going on and I hope to see you on the internet. Oh, and also, of course, I would be remiss if I did not mention uh, the Coolidge Theater, which is based in Massachusetts, does a film education series virtually as we are all locked in our homes from a pandemic. Um, and I was invited to do one and it is about Jennifer's body. Uh, so there's a seminar that comes with that. And then on October 8th, there will be a Q&A where people can part like you purchase uh, admission to the seminar and then you get to participate in the uh, Q&A where we just talk about it. We're just going to talk about the things that I'm going to get into that I've talked about on this podcast that I'm going to get into in the seminar. So if anybody wants to come hang out with me and talk about Jennifer's body and like ask questions and I ask you questions and we figure out what this movie means to all of us together please go to coolidge.org and buy buy admission to the seminar it would be super fun to hear more input from more people about Jennifer's body and I just want to point out because I did buy my ticket it's available globally so everybody can access it yes yes um, I love it Jordan thank you so much Thank you for having me. This has been a blast. <laughs> <laughs> and that is it for this episode of the Final Goals podcast. You can find us on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, wherever you get your shows. If you can, please do leave us a review on Apple Podcasts. It would mean a lot and it does help people find the show. You can find out more about what we do on the Final Goals at Code UK. Subscribe to our newsletter. Follow us on Twitter, Instagram and Facebook at the Final Goals UK. You can also follow Jordan on Twitter at Jord Crew. And I can be found mostly retweeting Jordan over on Anna B. Demented. Thank you for listening. And next week, we're going to be going into cypher horror territory again with Azora Barbie Brown coming back to the podcast to discuss Splice and Under the Skin.